Well, I am told we can start. So, um, dear fellow champions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me pleasure to welcome you to this first of uh, a three-part uh, webinar series being organized by the International Gender Champions. And this series will, as you know, focus on gender equality in the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to use this opportunity to thank our guests on this panel, Ambassador Lober, High Commissioner Bashle, Katia Iversen, Sabra Bano, thank you for joining us today. As chair of the board of the International Gender Champions, I wish to offer my unqualified support for the initiative that we are launching today. It has to do with a noble cause to which we are all committed. And I do trust that our exchanges today will be very fruitful. Indeed, we are facing an unprecedented global crisis that has a strong gender dimension. There is ample and compelling evidence out there that women are at the forefront of the health response. They are also the ones securing other essential services and maintaining the social fabric in these troubled times. Never before has the crucial role of women in society and in the economy been so evident. Failing to acknowledge and value this role will only weaken us in our common effort. We do recognize that women are also particularly impacted during this crisis because of the pre-existing gender discrimination. Women's job and income insecurity is becoming even more acute. Their immense share of unpaid work is on the rise, further undermining gender equality within families, and those in confinement with abusive partners are facing increased violence in their homes. Also, women's underrepresentation in decision-making fragilizes our common response to the crisis and undermines our ability fully to recover from the crisis. We need to count on the voices of women so we can make the right choices and build back in a more, be in a more efficient way. As a network of global leaders, we all need to play our part. There should be no more business as usual. Let us take this crisis as an opportunity to challenge the way we normally work and build back ever more resilient and gender responsive challenges. I count on your individual commitment and on our collective power to make this moment a game-changing one. I look forward to hearing from all of you on how you are dealing with this crisis in your respective organizations. You can count on the IGC network to help spread this collective knowledge and continue to prompt commitment to bring about change. Thank you and once more, Welcome to this webinar. Okay, good morning. Can you, can you hear me? Is that okay? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Jörg Lauber. I'm the permanent representative of Switzerland here at the UN in New York. And uh, I'm really excited about this event. Excellencies, uh, champions, uh, colleagues and friends, um, first of all, I really would like to thank Martin for uh, introducing uh, the event. Fantastic to see you uh, there. Thank you also for taking this important position at the head of the Secretariat. I want to thank the people, the colleagues uh, in the Secretariat for organizing uh, this uh, webinar, the whole series. Um, and uh, I'm really happy 
also to be sort of a bridge uh, today between uh, New York and uh, Geneva. I think it's a good thing. Um, honestly, I have to say when I when I I'm talking to my iPad, I see some pictures, but I, I really I really miss those meetings. Uh, we we used to complain about you know hours with other people in a sticky uh, uh, daylight free room. I miss it. I miss to meet all of you after discussions feel the vibe but we have to do what uh, what, we, what we have and uh, I think this is great still to be united with so many uh, champions out there. I would like to welcome uh, our distinguished panelists among them some longtime allies and and some heroes of mine. Uh, thank you very much High Commissioner Michel Bachelet, uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights for being with us for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Katja. Uh, Katja Iverson, the president uh, of Women Deliver. We've been uh, working uh, on different things, different things uh, in the past. And thank you very much to Ms. Sabra Bano, the director of Gender Concerns International. It's a great uh, panel uh, here today. Before I open the panel, uh, please allow me to share a few thoughts um, uh, with you. Some of them reflect what uh, Martin uh, just said. I think we all uh, uh, know it and we all in our particular individual way experience it that the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is creating a profound shock it is harming health but also social and economic well-being around the world and more than ever and this is important <clears throat> because the debate is ongoing but more than ever uh, a global a united response and urgent system-wide measures are necessary to face to face the challenge we all experience some effect of the pandemic, but it is not impacting everyone equally. And we know that there are different implications for men and women. From a strictly medical perspective, early evidence suggests that COVID-19 seems to hit men harder uh, than women. Fatality rates for men who have contracted the virus are 60 to 80% higher than for women. But Martin mentioned it already, as the virus spreads around the world, the impact of the pandemic on women is becoming increasingly severe. In terms of health outcomes, and in particular regarding the social and economical consequences, COVID-19 is affecting women in a number of ways. Let me just point out a few. Um, Martin mentioned that women are leading the health response. We all know that. They represent almost 70% of the health and social sector workforce, workforce globally, which exposes them obviously to a much greater risk of infection. At the same time, women are also shouldering much of the burden at home. Given the closure of schools and childcare facilities, as well as long-standing gender inequalities in un unpaid work. Ideally, the current situation would offer an opportunity to improve on those statistics. However, um, I'm afraid that in reality, it isn't necessarily so, which brings me to the next point. Lockdowns and quarantine measures increase the risk of domestic violence, exploitation, abuse or harassment due to the increased tension among members of the same household, difficult living conditions and breakdowns in community support mechanisms. Access to respective support services is often limited or even completely suspended. We know, of course, that women are not always the, victim of domestic, uh, the victims of domestic violence, but in reality, they are it in, overwhelming number, in the overwhelming number of cases. The health of women generally is adversely impacted through the reallocation of resources and priorities, including sexual and reproductive health services and therefore sexual and reproductive health and rights is a significant public health issue that requires high attention during this pandemic. Continued access to information and services for women and men is essential in order to leave no one behind. And finally, there is the imbalance of the economic impact of the crisis. Women face higher risks of job and income loss it's a fact that more women than men work in the informal sector where there is no job security and no safety net if a crisis like COVID-19 destroys their earnings. Colleagues, gender responsive actions and practices are critical to ensure that this crisis does not impact women disproportionately. It is crucial 
to place women and girls at the center of the response. Therefore, all policy responses to the crisis must embed a gender lens and account for women's unique needs, responsibilities, and perspectives. In this webinar, we will be asking our panelists to give their perspectives on how we can have gender responsive rather than just reactive leadership. As the crisis unfolds and emergency measures are put in place, what are the human rights threats and what humanitarian and economic needs should be forefront in our minds? How do we ensure women's meaningful participation in shaping global and national policies while raising their voices also in the media? Colleagues, before I'm starting the panel, I would like to try at least to share a picture with you that I saw this weekend uh, uh, when I was walking through the streets of New York and I felt, uh, when I looked at this, that I have to take a picture. This is so uh, on, on the spot uh, for, our, for our webinar today. I hope you can see it. Um, I think it depicts a, a, a woman health worker here in New York and as in every other place, it is the women who make that system uh, work essentially. Now turning towards our distinguished panelists, we are looking forward to hearing your insights and guidance on approaches, actions and practices to address these gender challenges to which we all have a responsibility to respond. I would like to address the first questions to the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, I have three questions for you, High Commissioner. Number one, as High Commissioner for Human Rights, what information are you receiving from your country and field offices about the most pressing challenges emerging for women and girls? Number two, can states mitigate these challenges and ensure more gender responsive policies? And number three, what is your call to policymakers? Thank you very much again, High Commissioner, for being with us this uh, afternoon, morning here, afternoon with you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, and uh, good morning and good afternoon uh, to all of you, and uh, particularly to my friend panelists, and I hope that you're all keeping well in these uh, difficult times. Uh, well, we, are, we all have been said that, of course, I'm a physician, I'm a pediatrician, and I've been an epidemiologist, so I've been in charge of, of course, in my country on, on, on pandemics and epidemics. But, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic is uh, the most serious health crisis in decades, and we know that the virus doesn't discriminate, but we recognize that some individuals are more vulnerable than others. So the challenges facing women and girls are not due to an inherent vulnerability. You, Ambassador, had mentioned something that in my pediatric experience as a, a doing neonatology, I saw always that when a girl, a newborn girl and, and, and boy were born, um, I mean, if the girl had more chances to survive with a, with a difficult disease, more chances to survive than the boys. And some people say now it's because women has double X chromosome that will provide a lot of uh, factors that will be positive. But, um, and as you say, on the contrary, the emerging data, uh, uh, the fatality rate uh, seems higher among men. And even, even in um, health workers, uh, where more women have been affected and probably infected, but more men health workers have, have, have have died. However, having said that, women and girls, particularly those living in poverty and belonging to marginalized groups, face specific human rights challenges due to pre-existing discrimination and consequent lower socioeconomic status. And my office, I mean, the Secretary General recently published this uh, policy briefing on, on, a, on the impact on women, and our office also, in online, we can find it, a specific guidance on COVID and human rights of women and girls with details on many of the challenges that now for time we're not going to be able to, to address. So let me mention four areas of concern. First, the right to work and access to livelihood. As you said, in most countries, uh, women are highly concentrated in the low wage and informal sectors and sectors that have been specially disrupted by lockdowns measures. So the 740 million women who globally work in the informal sector usually have no health insurance, no, no pension, no social security, and usually no savings. So they're really dealing, I mean, in the immediate response with a very difficult situation. And, and probably they will also have a very much um, grave possibility afterwards in the recovery. Uh, for all these women, access to livelihood will be at risk. For example, my colleagues in the field uh, stress the difficulties uh, situation of street vendors in Kenya and Uganda 
the majority of whom, whom are women. And many markets have been closed where women go and sell their groceries and things. So they are having an immediate effect and they will have probably a more difficult recovery and that has been seen in other pandemics. But also because women are also, uh, I would say, overrepresented in some uh, economic areas that has been closed, like the tourism, hospitality, and others. So, um, and, they can, and they cannot work from remote. So there is a strong challenge that when I pass to what state can be that we do, I will mention. The second is the right to be free from gender-based violence. You both, Martin, and you have mentioned the risk of gender-based violence, and we have seen it. It's not a theoretical risk. We have figures that show that. With the lockdown and quarantine measures, women and girls in abusive situations are more exposed to bias. When you think people in a, in a closed room without income, uh, with the fear, etc., that creates much more uh, risk, of, of course. And my, co I mean, we saw in France in the first week of our lockdown, the, an increase of 30% of reports of gender-based violence. Uh, Act uh, in Australia up to 75 percent. In Lebanon, it was double the numbers, and in Kenya, for example, during the th first three weeks of the crisis, the number of reports of gender-based violence spiked by 36 percent. So, what I haven't, I mean, first the situation is more risky, but other also access to services for victims of gender-based violence can be difficult due to confinement with the abuser. And also because in some countries those services have been deprioritized, suspended, or restricted. And shelters in some places have been uh, closed or avoided for fear of infection in several parts of the world. And we also receive reports of law enforcement officials being reluctant to intervene and arrest perpetrators due to the fear of spreading infections uh, or increases. The, other, the third element that I wanted to mention is the right to health. The greater caregiving role that women and girls are expected to perform at home and other places may expose them to higher risk of infection. And you mentioned some of the numbers that women comprise 70% of health workers. And reports indicate that they are often not provided with adequate protective equipment. As of 16 of April in Spain, 73% of health workers who were infected were women. In Italy, at the beginning of April, it was 66%. Access to health services can be undermined by pre-existing barriers including restricted freedom of movement, a lack of income, need of a third party authorization, and lack of childcare options. As resources many times are diverted to absorb the epidemic, the sexual reproductive health and services for women and girls can be undermined, including their access to maternal care, safe abortion care, and, um, and uh, contraception. And previous epidemics, and the Ebola epidemic, for example, show that maternal mortality rates increased. But because of this diversion of, uh, of resources, but also because sometimes we have been receiving reports of women not being attending during childbirth because of lack of ambulances or public transport to reach clinics. Unfortunately, some states, including abortion, including abortion among non-essential surgeries and medical procedures to be delayed during the COVID-19 response, so, in effect, denying women uh, access to safe abortion. And fourth, participation. Women and girls and their organizations are not equally represented in law. I mean, they're never equally represented. So this is not a new thing. But what we see it from Italy to Nigeria to Djibouti to the US and many other countries, all the task forces and committees created to shape COVID-19 response and recovery plan are heavily male dominated. So as past uh, health emergencies show, the lack of women leadership in such spaces has led to decisions that do not reflect their situation, needs, and rights. And let me give you one example that I live in the president of the Republic, where we had to deal with the 2008 economic crisis. My, the group of economists did, provided a fantastic stimulus package that the economists said that was the fifth best in the world, not in numbers, but in, in, in how it was of comprehensive was yes, but it has no gender lens. It will not include anything about it. So we need to make the changes. So as these few examples show, COVID-19 has disrupted our lives in many ways, but have not stopped gender-based discrimination. In relation to what can states can do to mitigate these challenges? Well, certainly they can. And efforts have been made uh, in many, many places to protect uh, human rights of women and girls while responding to uh, COVID emergency. Let me mention a few examples of what appears to be promising practice. And I have to tell you, we are collecting good practices in all the different areas, not only of, of COVID and gender, but also in other issues. Some governments are adopting uh, gender sensitive economic incentive and relief packages. For example, in India, economic relief pa packages specifically target women, including widows, 
Madagascar's social emergency plan includes street merchants, washerwomen, and sex workers among its beneficiaries. In Bolivia, the government is distributing a basket of foodstuff, canasta familiar, to mothers who are with low incomes. Also, a lot of measures have been um, taken to address gender-based violence. Some governments have declared that services for victim gender-based violence are essential, Spain and Portugal, among others. Others took measures to offer alternative accommodation to women, including paid hotel rooms in France. In other countries, such as India, Ireland, Lebanon, Portugal, Costa Rica, Morocco, Switzerland, and Uruguay, online, SMS, or telephone services were scaled up. Contact points and code words for victims were established in supermarkets and pharmacies in countries like Argentina, Bolivia, France, Spain, to make it easier for women to seek help. They cannot, if they are close to the abuser, tell them, look, I'm being abused. So they, for example, in Argentina, they can call a pharmacy and say, I need a red surgical mask, and they will bring uh, people to their home because they, they have invented all kinds of alternatives. Um, measures were taken to increase protection by law enforcement in Ireland, for example. The police launched a campaign to proactively contact all women who had previously denounced cases of violence. In Uruguay, a court protections order coming to an end were extended by 60 days. In terms of women's rights to health, states like Bahrain and United Arab Emirates are paying specific attention to the health of women and girls at risk in the prevention and response to COVID. Some states took measures to make sexual and reproductive health services accessible. For example, in France, the government took action to ensure continued delivery of the contraceptive pill to women, even if they are unable to renew their prescription. And I mean, the list is long and it's encouraging, not long enough. I would like to have more response, but, but it's interesting that there's a lot of things that have been happening. We continue to monitoring and we will be assessing whether these measures are effective as well as to collect and share promising practices emerging new concerns. What is my call to policymakers? First of all, as many of you are saying and probably will say, I, we think that this is an opportunity to look how the world is working, what works, what works for who, how we can really deal with what this pandemic has shown is the presence of huge inequalities. Nothing new, some people have for the first time discovered this. I mean, I've been in my life working about this, but, but of course, it has sort of mewed that even in developed countries, inequalities and, and, and of course the lack of investment in the health sector has been really important. So I hope we'll have a better, a better world afterwards and we we'll learn the lessons. But in concrete, in terms of women, I would say this is time to recognize the injustice of care work for falling disproportionately on women and to promote a more equal distribution. It's time to acknowledge also the critical contribution women make to our societies and the injustice of gender pay gap um, standing at 28% uh, for health workers, for example. And it's time to celebrate also the visionary women leaders who are showing some of the most compassionate and effective responses to the crisis and to call for more women in leadership. It's time to promote women's economic empowerment through gender transformative economic recovery strategies and plans. So now for the response, then to the recovery and for the future. And it's time to give women equal voice in shaping preparedness and response strategies and policy making in general. To end, Ambassador, 2020 was meant to be the year of women in commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. So let us still make it so. Let us come out of the COVID-19 crisis with more just, more equal, and therefore happier societies. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, High Commissioner. I couldn't agree more. And, and, and thank you very much uh, for your presentation and for, for the passion and the engagement that comes very well across even through, uh, through the screens here. It, it's, uh, it's great. Thank you so much. Katya, my next questions are for you. Bear with me. They're a little long. I'll, I'll, I'll read them out for you. Uh, so, so for the benefit of our audience. The first one is COVID-19 is wreaking havoc uh, on a wide array of health, economic, social, and personal decisions. However, what may be lost in the chaos among other effects and dangers is a specific impact on sexual and reproductive health and rights. What can be done to safeguard the sexual and reproductive health of, uh, and rights sorry, of girls and women at this critical time? Number two, Women Deliver is calling for a gender lens in all ongoing and post-pandemic policies to build a better world for all. Why does gender need 
to be in the center of response now so that we don't impede on recovery from COVID-19. And the third question, members of the G7 Gender Equality Advisory Councils, of which you are a part, urgently called on governments to apply a gender lens to COVID-19. In addition, your organization published a letter following the Secretary General's report on gender and COVID-19, also calling for a gender lens to the response and recovery efforts. What are some of the key actions governments and NGOs can take that will address the gender dimensions of the ongoing crisis? Katya, over to you. Thank you also for being here. It's great to have you on the panel. Thank you, thank you. Can we just kind of give a hand because, you know, yes, it's, it, it was supposed to be, but it actually is the year of women. And if it has ever been more visual and more, you know, kind of manifested than now. So let's give it, let's give a hand for the everyday cheer that we are seeing, including the 200 uh, gender uh, champions that are, are sitting, sitting around the globe watching this. It is so good to have the chance to, to join in you. We know uh, that as pandemic spreads, it's pushing both the healthcare system, but all systems to the limit. We know, and it's been said, that women are on the front line of the pandemic, both as the majority of health workers, social workers, essential service workers, and then they do the double shift at home and carry the majority of the unpaid care work. We also know that people still have sex, surprise, still need contraception during a pandemic. Women still get pregnant, wanted or unwanted, and they still give birth and they still have that human rights to health. So we need to push, we need to keep gender at the center. Right now, governments and health providers are having to make really difficult choices on what is essential care and resources are being diverted. But let me be absolutely clear about this. Sexual reproductive health and rights of girls and women is not a nice to it is a need to, it is an essential service, just as gender-based violence response is. It is more essential than ever that we protect it because if we're not careful, we're going to lose the ground we have won over the last decade and it might even cost more lives than we are losing to the tragic COVID right now. We've already seen access to reproductive health, including abortion, being classified as non-essential and unavailable to the women who need it. We're seeing resources being diverted away from maternal and reproductive health, and that can come back and bite us. Among the many challenges the pandemic presents is it threatens to uh, increase the gender inequalities that we see, uh, and we risk being pushed back on the progress we made, but we will not let that happen. We cannot abandon those hard won gains. And this is where your title as a gender champion needs to be manifested. Decision makers, global, national, local, they must, you must put girls and women at the center of your response and recovery and continue to invest politically and financially in girls and women. It's both the immediate crisis but it is also when we go to recovery, because if there ever was a day where it's clear that we need strong health systems, I think we can all agree that it is today. But it's also the economic system, economies and communities. We can be smart. We can lay down the tracks and build back for a much better future. So we need to see the immediate support and the safeguarding of maternal health of continued access to contraception, of protecting hygiene and dignity, because just as pregnancies don't pause in a pandemic, neither do, do periods. So critical services, but they often shadowed, overshadowed by the effort to fulfill the absolute and essential needs like food, water, shelter, and the COVID response. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. We know that the gendered implication of COVID-19 extend way beyond sexual and reproductive health and rights. And that is why women deliver many gender uh, champions, including the secretary general and the high commissioner and everybody on this, this webinar, we're calling for that full gender lens 
and a gender marker because it cannot just be words, it also has to be measured. The gender marker is a tool to demarcate whether activities actually target gender equality as a policy objective across all the responses. The High Commissioner uh, touched upon it. What do countries with some of the most efficient and effective pandemic responses have in common? Well, many of them are led by women. From Denmark to New Zealand to Taiwan, Germany, women leaders are showing the world not just the value of a collaborative, collective approach, but also how effective a gender lens is. And we must frame our pandemic, pandemic response with gender at that center, because we know that girls and women experience outbreaks different than boys and men. Yes, more men die, but the socioeconomic consequences, according to all research, hits girls and women harder. So the gender lens in the recovery, we can see, or we see specific risks, vulnerabilities and challenges because of the deep rooted inequalities. Uh, right now, just article out, we saw that one in three jobs held by women in the US has been designated as essential. That means they keep going to work. Non-white women, are more likely to be doing those jobs on the front line. Uh, we mentioned the 70% of health care workers, but it is also the social workers, it is also the cashiers in the supermarket and the, and the pharmacists in the pharmacy. Uh, and we know that more women are losing jobs in the coronavirus shutdown, dis despite even being on the front line. So Women Deliver and partners we call on, we have five actions uh, to decision makers, including everybody here. Uh, and it's based on the lessons from past health emergencies and also what can help steer uh, the world response. So pull out your pen and paper, feel free to write it down, I'm happy to send it us afterwards. But it is established that gender marker, gender marker to, to measure uh, and to manifest uh, the gender lens. It is um, have inclusive governance, uh, make sure that, um, that, that women uh, are also in the leadership, the lived experiences, the women on the front line need to be at the decision maker table and it's many of your tables. We need to invest in the local efforts. This is being fought on the front line. We make sure that everybody needs are being met in that re uh, recovery. So partner with and fund local organization. We see the civic space, the economic and political space for civil society decreasing right now and not least women's organization. And then it is investment in the comprehensive response and recovery. Little coordination is not bad either. We see duplication, uh, and that is a waste of everybody's resource. Um, it was super to see the, the Secretary General come out with the, the policy brief on uh, COVID and, uh, and women. It was good to see his call on gender-based violence. We're hearing that countries across the globe are picking this up. We are hoping that all of you do. Women Deliver played a role in uh, nudging the report to happen, but also feeding in together with you and women and a lot of partners. Um, but, but of course, it's not better than it will be used, else it's just words on a piece of paper. Uh, so it needs, to, it needs to get in. And then you mentioned your, the, the G7 uh, gender councils. Uh, we have had two councils in 2018 with, uh, with Prime Minister Trudeau and in 2019 with President Macron. And we got together and, you know, that was including, you know, Nobel Prize winners, uh, all the big work, and I was lucky to be there too. Uh, we helped, uh, Women Deliver helped uh, um, mobilize and, and also push that call to action to the G7 uh, leaders and beyond because it is about the gender lens and what needs to be invested in. We need to push up, put, keep, keep the pressure up. Uh, we cannot uh, let it fall. We know it easily falls off the agenda. So this morning, uh, based on a, on a letter, uh, Women Deliver and all the partners in the Deliver for Good 
uh, campaign, Deliver for Good, Deliver for Girls and Women. We campaigned 500 organizations and entities sent to the Secretary General. This morning we put that call to action for a broader sign up uh, out. So, uh, so um, we encourage everybody uh, to, sign, to sign up for that. And it is overarching the gender lens to preparedness, response and recovery, but also going very much into detail what it actually is that needs to happen. We want to use this to mobilize a broader, uh, a broader push, uh, and we, we hope you'll join us. Um, so yeah, we need to put the good tracks down. We need to deal with the immediate. We need to safeguard the wins we've had in sex and reproductive health and rights and gender equality at large. And then we need to put the tracks down for a more inclusive, more gender equal future. We know that a gender equal world is healthier, wealthier, more prosperous and more peaceful. It is the right thing to do, but it, take, it takes people to do it. It takes people with power to do it. And those people are sitting right here, right now. So it's up to all of us. Thank you very much, Katja. And uh, they're sitting and being eager to put this into action. I have no doubt they'll put down your five points. And maybe you want to send out the list anyway, but thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks also for again mentioning the Secretary General's, uh, our fellow gender champions uh, report. I think it was very essential and important in spite of everything that's going on and uh, must be on this desk to, to draw everybody's attention uh, to this. And uh, I assume that the High Commissioner's Office and UN Women had something to do with this. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution. Um, and we so know that a new report is coming out this week on human rights and COVID. So that we really hope that has a strong gender lens as well. It will be this week, Katya. This week, okay. right? Probably on Friday. We're ready. <laughs> And, and I, I'm uh, my, um, as soon I will call on the High Commissioner to see how we can promote this also in New York to bring the, 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 the gender and the wider human rights perspective uh, to New York. But that's uh, for after after this meeting. Um, uh, Sabra, thank you very much for for your patience. Uh, the next uh, questions are for you. Uh, bear me three, three questions for you as well. Thank you for being with us. Um, you recently launched the uh, Share Cares COVID-19 campaign to promote women's participation and leadership in the global response and highlight the necessity to apply a gender lens. Could you please tell us a bit more about this campaign? My second question, you have issued a report last week on COVID-19 recovery and gender inclusive response, an urgent needs assessment highlighting the impact of COVID-19 on gender equality shortcomings in democracy, women, peace and security and environment. The question is in what way do you consider gender equality has suffered a backlash in these areas and what might be an effective response as short and long-term recovery targets? And my third question, this crisis is likely to hit women, especially those who are underprivileged, harder than men on the economic level as well. If discussed this and the panelists mentioned this already. Now, what are the necessary steps from your point of view to be taken now to support their economic resilience, including in, in particular in developing countries? Ara, over to you. Thanks again for being with us. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be uh, here this afternoon, your morning, uh, at this panel. Uh, very much inspired by the opening remarks of the chair. I think it has set the tone uh, for passion and dedication that should be expressed and perhaps taken further uh, as an outcome to this discussion. Uh, Co-panelists uh, also have brought very inspiring uh, information, but also call for action. Uh, when it comes to Gender Concerns Initiative, uh, we were quite quick in launching this campaign, reaching out to our partners and stakeholders in some of the countries that we have been active since past 16 years. Uh, most of those countries are in, uh, uh, they're considered conflict uh, uh, zones, uh, where situation has already been uh, precarious. Uh, so we have tried to, to collect information 
from women's leaders, and these are the leaders of women's organizations, how are they experiencing uh, the lockdown situation and also the helplessness to go back to their communities, uh, especially uh, in MENA region or in Myanmar or in Libya, Pakistan, Afghanistan. So the campaign was a tool to answer your first question, just to reconnect with the community and collect some evidence so we understand what is happening in uh, developing countries and how our partners are responding. Together with that line of action, we have also reached out to civil society networks in the Netherlands, but also large women's organizations. And we have come up with this uh, sort of uh, uh, joint action plan that even considering on domestic level uh, that we have elections next year, we should reach out to politicians as a demand for equal pay for health sector workers. It includes all health uh, professionals, including the cleaners who are the right hand of these healthcare workers in the hospitals and vicinities. So that was the scope of the campaign that we have tried to uh, combine the effort of women uh, globally, not just in the global south, but also in the Netherlands and in Europe. Then we thought, as emphasis was quite much on healthcare sector, and rightly so, we also saw that, uh, and especially as a response to the call of Secretary General for Peace, uh, I think that was very important. And despite the call was made that we don't want war and war must stop because we have to fight the war of uh, COVID, this, this, this crisis is important. Unfortunately, uh, not much has happened so far, but that has also given us hope that perhaps women in Libya and women in Afghanistan and in other countries would be taking a leading role in terms of having peace time and taking care of their families and and uh, 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 and getting back to uh, their uh, partners uh, and and focus on uh, healthcare issue. Somehow that that is that is also very very concerning for us. Uh, then we also have noticed our one of the major areas that gender concern works is observing elections from gender perspective. And the issue we raise is gender electoral parity. And we have seen that with the COVID, the rise in authoritarianism is, uh, is a great backlash. This is what we are also uh, we are in consultation with major election observation missions uh, and also organizations that are supporting electoral system worldwide. Same goes for activism in environmental field. I mean, this year, 2020, was a year of hope and aspiration and expectation. We had uh, 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 CSW that is that was postponed, and after that there was a series. Till now, I mean, now even COP has been postponed. So all this work that has been planned, we are trying to sort of still maintain the uh, the the work that that is not going to be lost. So there are a lot of challenges, and I think we are all puzzled. We are all. Uh, sort of very much concerned that how we are going to take care of our communities, uh, our concerns. And in that, the problem of uh, the activism is that the barriers of gender equality that have been women's organizations for decades who have contributed voluntarily a lot to raise the flag 
of equality have not been taken on board uh, in terms of decision making on resource allocations. And this is what the report that we have brought now, it, it talks about the vitality of international women's organizations. We also see that through UN mechanism and rightly, some assistance has been now provided to local women's organizations, but they are you know, mechanism to, to also uh, support the partnership and relationship that exists between international women's organizations and their partners in developing countries. Because in general, from my perspective, that role of serving local needs is quite largely served by UN mechanisms. So my plea is, uh, as a methodology, to how to make this gender lens uh, uh, very uh, deliverable, is to engage women's groups and build their capacity. Because I think gender lens indeed is important. It, is, it, it needs to be there. And we need expertise to analyze all aspects of our response in all areas. But who are the agents for change and what is their role to be engaged? And I think this is where uh, we have tried to bring this report in which we have also uh, uh, demanded that respect, recognition, and resources are necessary for women's organizations, the three R approach that gender concerns has always promoted in recognition of women's work. Then we also think that it is important that uh, dedicated funds, our funding line should be launched and it's supported by a net network like IGC that is responsible to activate women's groups in times of need, that it, it should not be coming from various other funds, but it should be separate lines, separate funds, and perhaps, perhaps not necessarily through UN system, but as, as next to that, uh, 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 given independently uh, through an independent body, a group to international and local women's organizations in addition to what is going on. This is how we think on the basis of analysis of the problem, uh, the, the challenges that in, uh, uh, women's organizations are facing in terms of delivery, uh, lack of resources. Other problem is, and it was in 2005, uh, I was able to identify the lack, a total absence of gender perspective and gender expertise in times of crisis at the level of need assessment. So when at the time of need assessment, gender perspective, expertise, activists are not included, the resource allocations are not going directly to be clustered for their needs. It will go through various channels. And I think we see this happening also today. That's why we have come up with another recommendation, and this is what I think this uh, IGC channel is the best place to, to at least seek guidance, that we need to have an international, um, to establish a high level international gender advisory body that puts forward an action plan in times of crisis to ensure the engagement of vital women organization. I mean, such a body does not exist. And I think it is needed. Um, gender concerns is very uh, much um, willing to take this kind of um, uh, um, initiative uh, that assesses the, uh, the need of any crisis and then in various clusters how do you uh, integrate gender approach, but also that resources are 
uh, allocated and channeled through active women's organizations because they are there all the time. And they are the ones who are sort of uh, contacted, are taken care of at the last. So uh, this is what uh, our recommendations are in terms of dealing with the economic uh, hardship of women uh, in healthcare sector, activism and women peace and security, but also the women's contribution uh, in environmental decision-making. We need respect, resources, and perhaps through this uh, distinguished uh, network, perhaps we could set up some kind of mechanism that will have long-term impact on, on the engagement of activist groups alike, local, as well as international. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabra. And thanks to all of the, the three panelists for your presentations and for being uh, at the, at the one, on the one hand very uh, enthusiastic and passionate, but also very precise in your analysis of the challenges uh, we are facing and in your recommendation also. Uh, how to make the best uh, of this uh, really uh, difficult situation. We are a little bit over time, but uh, we still have an opportunity if you would like to um, respond to some of the uh, things you heard from your fellow panelists. Can I ask the High Commissioner first, would you like to respond to your fellow panelists briefly? Did you pick up on anything you would like to comment on? Madam High Commissioner, please. Well, I think we all agree that during the response, and during the recovery, uh, women should be at the center uh, of the concerns uh, on, uh, on the response, but also on the defining uh, the, uh, policies, because they're, they're not only victims, they're not only vulnerable, but they are part of the solution. They are very important in community organization. They're very important of, both, uh, of, um, of a ground organization. So I truly believe that even though the, the current conditions is very difficult for people, particularly poorest women, to be able to participate because of their lack of access to digital technologies and all that. We need to be more creative and find how we can ensure that women's perspective is there. Because otherwise, we, we will be leaving them behind and we will be not responding adequately. But also, as our colleagues have mentioned, this has to make us change the role that women play in our society for, for, for like all the vulnerabilities and all the inequalities. We cannot try to go to normal as before. We need to, what comes after this, that needs to be much better. And women has to be there. Thank you. Thank you much, High Commissioner. Katya, any remarks? We, we, we agree. Uh, I have, you know, if this is kind of my last chance to, to say something before we, we, we move on, I kind of, I have, um, I have a message, I have an ad and I have a tweet. So the message is get that gender lens out. <laughs> Dear fellow gender champions, get it out, apply it in your COVID response and recovery to your plans and policies and beyond. This is not just about COVID. We want to put down tracks for the future and we want the future to be with a gender lens. You're a gender, you're a gender champion, you're powerful. Use that power. The ad, as I mentioned, Women Deliver and hundreds of partners in the Deliver for Good campaign this morning put out that big call to action to put the, the gender equality and the health rights and well-being of girls and women at the center. Uh, so I encourage, I urge you to sign it. And if I may, you know, the tweet, join, sign, share, pick up the gender lens and apply a gender marker. Use your power, deliver for good, deliver for girls and women in hashtag COVID-19 response and recovery, hashtag build back better. Thank you much. Thanks, Katya. That picture will stay the, the length, the picture of the lens. You will have, of course, uh, other opportunities uh, this afternoon to respond to some of the discussion. But before we go there, Sabra, do you have any comments on what you just heard or any, any remarks at this point of our webinar? Thank you. Very briefly, I, I just have a question. 
And question is, does the pandemic provide an opportunity for women organizations taking lead in inclusive COVID-19 recovery and response? We call it ICRR, programming. If answer is yes, that would be great. If you are thinking about it, please keep thinking and <laughs> share your advice at hashtag SheCaresCovid19. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much again, the three of you. Um, before I pass on for the Q&A, uh, if, if I may, one, one, just one remark. It, to me, it really comes down to the, the basic, the fundamental message of the gender champions that we need uh, diversity in, at every stage of policymaking, decision-making. It's not possible to have uh, all male decision-making. It's also not good to have all, we, all female decision-making. I think we need, that's the key. Uh, decisions are being taken that concern everybody. So we need diversity. We need gender balance at every step, at every stage. But this uh, brings us uh, to the conclusion of the first part of the panel discussion. And I would like, again, uh, thank uh, the panelists for your uh, for your time and also for your contributions. And I will now we will now move uh, to the private discussion among gender champions and focal points. And I'm passing over to Fleur, who is going to moderate the Q and A session. I'll come in back again later. Thank you very much.